Part 1. You'll hear a woman talking on the radio about sport aid. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. You're listening to Redgate Radio and I'm Alex Dunbar. As you may know, people in the city will be taking part in Sport Aid this weekend. Here's Liz to tell us more about this event and how you can get involved. Thanks, Alex. Well, this is the fourth year of Sport Aid and it looks like it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Sport Aid is organised by the City Council and it supports a number of different charities, although the main reason for its existence is to raise money to help developing countries. Last year, it raised over £100,000 and that money has helped to make life a little easier for people in many parts of the world. Just to give you one example, the village of Otunga in Chad now has a water supply, meaning that the people no longer have to walk miles every day just to get water. And there are countless stories like that. By contributing to the infrastructure of different regions, it's hoped that things like sport aid will enable many more people to climb out of poverty. Another way in which that happens is by giving people the knowledge and skills to earn money. One of the biggest issues facing people in many poorer areas of the world is education. Something that we take so much for granted can be rare and expensive in some regions. Education is seen as key to development and money from sport aid has paid for schoolrooms and equipment in a number of places. So what can you do to help? There are lots of ways in which you can get involved. First of all, you can go down to the biggest attraction of the day, the Sport Aid Charity Football Match. There will be thousands of people at City Stadium and all the money raised from the sale of tickets goes to charity. There's much more going on than just a football match, of course. There will also be lots of entertainment for the whole family, including a fair, stalls selling all kinds of food, and even a chance to try out some sports you may not have tried before, like softball and volleyball. It's probably going to be a very active day, so it's best to make sure that everyone is in comfortable clothes before you go down there. It's always a fantastic day out, and it's a great way to show your support. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. But you're not restricted to being a spectator. Apart from the main event, there are a large number of smaller events taking place across the city. These range from fun runs around the park to games of cricket, and there's sure to be something happening in your area. Contact details are available for the people putting together each event, and you can get those from the council website. We'll be giving you the address for that at the end of the program. It's still not too late to organise your own event, as lots of people around the city are, although you'll have to get going on it now. First of all, do check that there isn't a similar event in your area, and then call the town hall to register your event. The local council needs to approve all events, and you'll stand more chance if you can come up with a sport that's new to some people, rather than just another game of football. Use your imagination, or try the internet to get some ideas. Try to come up with something that's going to get lots of people along, and which will raise money. You might not want to go for anything that turns out to be too costly, though, since the council isn't able to supply bats or balls or anything else you need. 
that they will give you advice on finding a good location and might even be able to help you out with small prizes for winners, as well as making sure that everyone knows about your event by publicising it on the website and sending you an organisers pack with lots more information. There are a couple more things you need to be aware of for your event. There aren't any age restrictions. Although, if you're under 18, you'll need to get an adult, such as a parent, to sign the forms for you and to handle any money raised. But you do need to live in the Red Gate area. You should also be prepared for anyone to turn up, since all events are public. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a local radio program about cycling courses in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly does City Cyclists do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So, if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, we aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. At City Cyclist, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists' Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behaviour is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorised traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need to travel safely and effectively. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organizations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organisation, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C I T I Cyclist. Co.uk. And in order to book lessons, you can either phone us on 020 7562 4028 or do it online. There's an application form on our website and you can just download that and send it in. We charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons, plus £6 for each extra person. So you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour, and for most people a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, We'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a program just for you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian and so on, but Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. 
So are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay. Well, how are we going to organize this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And... A recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick-serve beef, for stir-fries, I suppose, and premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast, and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on archaeology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Many thanks for inviting me along today to talk to you about the results of some very interesting recent archaeological research. The saying, you are what you eat, is often applied to present-day dietary advice. Certainly, our bodies will show evidence of whether we eat healthily or live on fast food and takeaways. This can be particularly useful in archaeological research. Through a careful analysis of the ancient bones of our ancestors, we can tell a great deal about their diet and the way they lived. I'd like to talk to you today about some research into the early settlers of some remote tropical islands in the Pacific. When these people travelled to these new lands 3,000 years ago, they had to bring along all the resources they needed for survival, including food, plants and animals from their original homes. One such group were the Lapita people, who were early settlers of remote Oceania, several islands in the Pacific. When the Lapita set sail for the island Vanuatu, they brought with them domestic animals and crop plants. This allowed them to settle in an area where no humans had previously lived and that had limited natural resources. Archaeologists have been keen to discover to what extent these settlers and their domestic animals relied on the resources they'd brought with them compared to the native plants and animals they found on the island. In order to try and understand the diet and lives of the Lapita people, archaeologists analysed the chemical composition of the bones of 50 adults excavated from the Lapita cemetery on Ifate Island, Vanuatu. Depending on what we eat, we consume varying amounts of carbon, nitrogen and sulphur. As these chemical elements are ultimately deposited in our bones, the amounts or ratios of each one can provide a sort of dietary signature. For instance, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues, and as animals eat plants and other animals, nitrogen builds up in their own system. The presence of different ratios of chemical elements may show whether a human or an animal ate plants, animals or both. Carbon and sulphur ratios offer another clue to diet. Carbon ratios, for example, differ between land and water organisms, as do sulphur ratios, the values of which are much higher in aquatic organisms compared to land-based organisms. As well as examining the settlers' bones, scientists carried out a comprehensive analysis of the chemical elements found in the settlers' likely food sources. This included modern and ancient plants and animals. They found that early Lapita inhabitants of Vanuatu may have searched for food rather than relying entirely on food they'd grown themselves during the early stages of colonisation. In the longer term, they probably did grow and consume food from the resources they'd brought with them, but early on, they appear to have relied as much on a mixture of fish, marine turtles and fruit bats, as well as their own domestic land animals. They also provide clues to the culture of the settlers. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions For one thing, males had much higher nitrogen levels compared to females, which indicates greater access to meat. 
This difference in food consumption may support the hypothesis that Lapita societies were ranked in some way, or it may suggest dietary differences associated with the work people were involved in. Additionally, the archaeologists analysed ancient pig and chicken bones and found that carbon levels in the settlers' domestic animals indicated that they were eating a diet mainly of plants. However, their nitrogen levels indicate that they may also have roamed freely, eating foods such as insects. This would have allowed the Lapita people to keep food resources that were in short supply for themselves, rather than feeding them to their domestic animals. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.